Right. Um, well, thanks for having me. Um, this is relatively old work and is, is partly a, a sort of charting of, of unintended consequences or, or something that slightly failed in its original intention but did something slightly more interesting. Um, and it was an earlier project um, with the um, ESRC, no, EPSRC and AHRC under Designing for the 21st Century, this big bold banner back in 2007-2008 at the University of Strathclyde. And I joined it as the postdoctoral researcher at that point and was handed a rather uh, poison chalice of being asked to design a way um, to design for all of the senses. I was asked to, to come up with a method for designing which encompassed all the senses, particularly within urban design. And it was addressing uh, a perceived problem with uh, the, the, the visual bias within urban design. Now, through that process, um, what I found was that there's not so much a visual bias as a geometric bias, but actually what we think of as being the, the visual bias of architecture and urban design doesn't account for a great deal of what the, the visual uh, sense actually um, gives us. And it's more to do with form, it's more to do with the, the actual uh, formal characteristics of space, the geometry, um, even things like sight lines that we've seen earlier. And that these biases leave a great deal out of how we understand the built environment. Now, it comes out of a background of, of two separate uh, things. Firstly, that uh, I have a background in architecture, but also in social anthropology. And uh, I did a project there which was looking at the the embedded creativity in architectural drawing practices and different forms of notation. Um, so I was experimenting with things like uh, Laban movement notation as a way of understanding uh, complex uh, situations like getting lost in a Tokyo subway station. And also uh, worked on a project with um, Richard Coyne, whose, whose name was flashed up earlier in Edinburgh, on uh, the soundscape, particularly to do with the use of the voice within urban uh, environments as a, as, a, as, a, so, as, as a determinant of how we understand those environments. Um, but this project was interesting because it, it wasn't looking to focus on one sense. It was looking, um, and you know, I'm, I'm always really aware of using visual metaphors when I speak all the time, um, something that we all uh, do to a certain extent. Um, but we were, we, were under, we were looking to understand uh, how all of the senses interact um, in uh, the urban environment. Um, so I started obviously with a kind of literature review and it brings you know, some of the heavyweights to bear. You know, get Maurice Merleau-Ponty on the phenomenology of perception. Um, the, the, this distinction between what is visible and what is sensible. Um, and this, you know, these, these fine distinctions become quite useful. Um, that, you know, this idea of the, the sensible as, as being what is, is, is uh, understood through the senses and that we can uh, try to, to think about um, sensory perception as something which can both be educated but which is also a form of knowledge in itself. Um, Christian Norberg Schultz um, on the phenomenon of place um, gives us a, a wider understanding that two, uh, two places, with two, with two, two environments which have the same physical makeup can actually feel very different um, when they're occupied in uh, different ways. And that speaks a little bit to this sort of social production of space that we're uh, talking around. And that, that's a, an interest which I've, I've carried on in my more recent research that I'll maybe get a chance to talk about briefly later on. Uh, obviously in architecture, uh, when you talk about the senses, Johanna Palasma's name comes up very, very quickly in those um, uh, discussions. And he, he lends a sort of poetic air to this. And I think that, uh, that, that joyfulness of language around um, sensory experience is something that we too quickly move away from. We lose that too quickly. And he's asking you, is, uh, you know, it, the, about the measure of the, the sense of the city. You know, in the city of your memory, can you hear the laughter of children, the flut flutter of pigeon wings, the shouting of a peddler? Can you recall the echo of your footsteps? 
can you imagine yourself falling in love? And I think that, that to me, seems like the aim that we should have in mind, however we go about that, is to, to think about uh, the, the, the sensorial uh, nature of the, the city as, as something which is important for, for our very humanity. But in a more pragmatic sense, going back to uh, people like James Gibson, um, which belies my uh, training with Tim Ingold in anthropology, um, where he talks about the, the distinction between uh, the photographic camera and what our eyes do. In a similar way, we can talk about the difference between our microphone and what we actually hear. So that there's a distance between these recording technologies and how we actually perceive the world around us, and that we should remain mindful of that distinction. Sorry, what, what did you mean by that? Um, the camera, um, well, a uh, microphone, for example, picks up certain frequencies of sounds um, un in an un unfiltered uh, fashion. So that, you know, the, the classic example is the cocktail party effect, which, uh, uh, by which in a, a packed room with lots of people chatting, gabbling, talking away, you will be able to pick out your own name if it's uttered on the other side of the room because your brain is filtering the sound in a very particular way. So that the analogy with a microphone um, isn't uh, as accurate as it could be um, in terms of the ear. We quite often try to understand the optics of the eye um, through the optics of a camera, but the camera is uh, not, uh, you know, nowadays they're, they're, they're closer to it because they're, they're self-setting, self-focusing, but they're not tracking all the time. They're not, you know, there's not that sasan, there's not, you know, that, that mobility of the, the eye, um, which is, you know, refocusing and rethinking all the time as, as it observes. So there's always that additional complexity, no matter how good the technology gets, about how we perceive the world um, through our own senses. So Gibson um, divides the senses in, in quite an interesting way. He talks about perceptual systems, and he talks about uh, the modes of attention. Attention is, is the, the real generating concept within Gibson's work. And that by paying attention to things, um, you know, that, that there, there's a difference between passive perception and that which we pay attention to. Um, and some of our attention has, has to do with mobility, it has to do with moving around. It, you know, it's not always from this static viewpoint. Um, but he's interested in, in talking about the mode of attention as you know, talking about listening, touching, smelling, tasting, rather than the abstraction of smell, taste, vision, and so on. Um, but he divides it into these systems, um, some of which are obvious, the auditory system, but others um, are divisions which we might not be so familiar with. So, you know, the, the, the haptic and the, or the, 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 the two chemical senses of smell and taste which are kind of um, placed together. And these formed the beginnings of a framework for perceptual systems which we felt were specific to um, the urban environment. Um, but in devising the notational system, this is a very quick rattle through of something which still doesn't take too long to describe. We went through a number of variations and uh, attempts at notational systems. Firstly, um, to enable us to record uh, the sensory environments that we were in um, in order to produce catalogues of uh, your own experience, sketchbooks if you will, of how you've experienced the world around you, but also as a process of diagnosing um, certain uh, situations that we come across in the urban environment so that we could send groups of, of people out to all make recordings in a similar way to the, the scent walks and, and other forms of uh, walking practice and then to compare uh, with one another about those individual responses. Um, not, not simply to even them out, not simply to aggregate, but to talk about the distinctions and differentiations that, that people had. And this um, resulted in, in uh, the, the system, which has a relative simplicity of it, which then expands as it goes on. And in order to do this, you need to kind of channel or you know, scarily organize people's perception. So first of all, to note the location that, that's being recorded. Then we had a, a set of uh, descriptor words um, for each of the senses, um, hopefully is, uh, uh, reducing the amount of metaphor within those phrases. 
And then there was a, a graphic step to do with the, the priority of the senses, not making a distinction between good and bad sounds, good and bad smells, but simply what was most prominent at any given point. Then we talked about corroboration. Um, the, the best example of this is the, the presence which a, a tree would have within an urban environment. Um, partly because it, it sort of it sits on all levels of sensory perception. It's a visible item. The tree, the, the leaves rustle in the wind. In certain situations, it will give out a scent. Um, thermally, it will give shade. You know, it has it has a, a tactile uh, presence, which which you quite often come into contact with. So that notion of corroboration of the different senses um, lent a sort of richness to. Uh, that, that particular uh, presence within the environment. And finally, temporality, um, to do with whether something was constant, uh, whether it had a, a repetitive uh, rhythm to it, or other things like that. Um, but the element which people pay most attention to is this uh, uh, notation uh, chart, which has these six uh, perceptual systems arranged, um, and simply uh, asks people to uh, note which is most important in a given situation. So you have the visual, the kinetic to do with movement, uh, the chemical to do with taste and smell, the oral, and the thermal, and the tactile. So um, things which might normally be considered as a subsets of, of, of uh, bodily sense or touch are kind of teased out a little bit because of their importance in the, uh, in the, the urban uh, realm. Um, and obviously taste and smell are collapsed into a chemical sense here. So a standard chart would have a priority distribution from one to six. You see that you get a graphic from that. Um, other places might have a low amount of stimulation. So you know the example here was a really boring shopping mall in the middle of Dortmund, um, nothing going on. Um, so you can mark it just as this utter reduction in the, the sensory uh, realm. Or it could be completely overstimulated somewhere like Shibuya Crossing in Tokyo where things are blaring out at you, advertising, coming at you, traffic and people moving everywhere, etc. Um, you can have particular spikes in priority depending on what's going on. You can have a space that is characterized really strongly by a single sense. Um, And other places which might have differentiations, so that you have you might have three channels of oral input, for example, that are quite distinctive from one another that you want to chart um, in particular ways. And simply, you start to draw over the top of this the, the sense of corroboration, uh, additional symbols to do with temporality, um, whether something is situated, singular, constant, etc. And you would then attach these descriptor terms to this. Now this all felt very abstract. That, that became problematic through the process. But it was something that could be taught very quickly. Um, and I've used this rather than with professionals or, or in, uh, in social engagement projects. It's more been in the education of architects. Um, it's been part of um, a course which has been called a number of things, uh, most notably graphic anthropology, which is to do with observational strategies in architecture, which is to do with bringing anthropological theories into uh, architectural teaching and coupling those with graphic methods in order, to, uh, in order to refine them and bring them into the design process. So large numbers of students have been able to discuss their sensory experiences using this system. And it became quite useful as a talking point more than as a robust design tool. Um, but the, the system can be sort of collapsed down to this kind of key. You would go out just with these diagrams drawn. And then over the top of that, there's a narrative that needs to be written. And that, that was the missing link within this, was the, the richness of language um, you know, is, is uh, kind of uh, missing from this uh, here. So that the eventual accounts which were made um, of the uh, of the places that 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 I visited and, and gave accounts of um, as a kind of uh, pattern book um, relied on um, conventional architectural drawings of plan and section um, 
and also large amounts of text and photographs of the various things. And these, these texts would be annotated throughout, telling you where the, the diagrams at the bottom were actually referred to within the text, where there's an important um, uh, where there's an important item within that uh, that discussion, uh, there would be a photograph of that. Got slightly overexcited with the uh, transitions. So. Um, but these, these things are all referred to within the text, and you have these, these longer um, pieces of text which are written in a fairly flat, yeah, uh, fairly sort of flat uh, descriptive uh, style, um, which was inspired a little bit by a, a quote from George Perrick about um, writing about things as, as, as being as utterly banal and straightforward as possible. So when you read it back a few weeks later on, you get this incredible richness just by stating the facts of the matter. So I produced this um, this um, document uh, for several cities, um, and it's become a bit of a hobby project, you know, on the side of other things. But it does continue to inform the work that I'm doing at the moment, which is to do with socially produced spaces where architects don't have their dirty fingers on it so much. <laughs> um, so that the two contexts that I'm looking at at the moment are some urban marketplaces in South Korea, particularly Nam Daemon Market in Seoul, um, which is uh, a space of reciprocity, but also of overlapping uh, interests, I suppose. Um, you know, the, the presence of infrastructure and the, 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 the resistance to gentrification. And the second is the Sanjanatsu Festival in Saksa, Tokyo, which is an annual event, which is very firmly embodied um, to do with the, the carrying of very heavy, mobile pieces of architecture around the city. Um, but this pattern book um, had accounts from uh, maybe about six or seven cities with ten um, different accounts in each, um, just as a sampling of what kind of things you would find there, and that allowed for um, the production of various um, journal papers about uh, comparisons between sacred sites such as uh, Meiji Jingu, as you see here, and um, Sensoji, which is a slightly different uh, place uh, within Tokyo as well. But you can see within the section here that you have these heavy gates with the lanterns, but you also have um, incense and braziers um, alongside cold water fountains and you have changes in elevation, you have smoke and changes to the atmosphere and you have all of these engaging things going on that embed this place so firmly in the memory um, that it's a space which isn't all about the visual, it's about the breathing in the smoke, it's about putting your hands under the, the, the cold, cold water and washing your mouth out with it. So again, that rhythm of going through these things and producing sort of large accounts of it as the basis for future design. The analogy is with the sketchbook all the time. Um, so I'll stop this swishing soon. Um, a number of papers that came out of this. Um, I feel like I've rattled through that slightly. Um, we had a, a conference <coughs> in 2008 and just self-published the, uh, the proceedings from that. Um, and this has some examples of the limitations in a bit more detail. Um, I've, I've given away all of the copies of the, the more substantial book that I had. So I'll shut up now. Thank you very much. <laughs>